Right. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is another talk in our research seminar series. And today we have Italo Gonzalez uh, visiting us virtually to give a talk on uh, learning spatial patterns with variational uh, Gaussian processes. He's a professor at uh, Universidade Federal da Pampa uh, in Brazil. Uh, he is uh, a mining engineer originally, but uh, in the last seven, eight years, right? He started uh, paying more yeah. attention to machine learning and uh, uh, yeah, he, ma he managed to make some uh, interesting progress uh, in, uh, uh, when it comes to variational infers for uh, GPs, especially applying them to uh, spatial uh, problems. So yeah, we're very excited to uh, uh, hear on uh, hear about your work, Italo. Uh, you can take it from here. Okay, uh, thanks, Roy. Uh, your Portuguese uh, is really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, my name is Italo, and that's the work: uh, learning spatial patterns with uh, variational Gaussian processes. So, let me talk a little about uh, the place where I work. It's a small university in Rio Grande do Sul, the, the southernmost state in Brazil. I work here at Caçapava do Sul. And uh, this is a small university uh, spread across 10 towns in the interior of the state, uh, close to Uruguay and Argentina. So uh, a little about me. So I graduated in 2007 in mining engineering. I finished my PhD in mining engineering also in 2014. And uh, since 2015, I started uh, working a little with machine learning. Everybody was talking about it. So uh, when I joined uh, the university here, I had to uh, change my research focus. So why not machine learning? Then I finished the data science specialization and I have been able to publish a, a few papers since then. Yeah. So uh, why does uh, mining engineering have to do with the GP? Uh, some of you might know, there's this technique called Kriging, which was uh, in fact invented by a mining engineer in South Africa. And then later the some people in France developed the theory behind it and uh, they named it Kriging. And then at some point, people in, uh, in the machine learning community uh, adopted this technique and called it the Gaussian process. So uh, the goal of this work here is to uh, gather all the developments that uh, have been made by the machine learning community and uh, apply the, it back uh, in the regional field of mining engineering. So the main uh, task here is to make a model of mineral deposits based on a few scattered data points. So here on the right, we have an example. We have uh, some dots here representing samples in space, and we must build a model of the distribution of the, the gold in this case in space. So that's the, the main objective. Uh, of the, the GP in the mining industry. So uh, what's a GP? Uh, in essence, uh, we can say it's a probability distribution for functions. We have X and we have F of X, which follows the, the GP distribution. And if we have data, we can constrain the possible values uh, of this function uh, at the neighborhood of the, the data points. The, let's say the, the core of the GP is the covariance function. And we, we define a kernel, which is a model for the, how the, the points are correlated uh, according to distance. And we have the data values here and we interpolate the, the values and the, their uh, variance across space. If we cut a slice of the GP, we will find a normal distribution. So at, at any point in space, the, 
there will be a normal distribution with the mean and uh, variance. And they have here the colored lines are possible functions that can be sampled from uh, this GP, GP. So what's the variation of Gaussian process? There are, uh, in my view, two uh, main differences uh, between the variational and the standard GP. The first one is the use of inducing points. So we don't deal directly with the data points. Instead, we have a number M of uh, inducing points. They are, we can say they are fictional points. They have a position, mean, and variance, which can be uh, tweaked in order to fit the data points. And we have a general likelihood. So we are not constrained to the, uh, to the Gaussian likelihood and the, the square error minimization. So the, we approximate the true likelihood of the data using variation or inference. So the, 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 our, let's say our loss function here, instead of a loss function, it's the, the evidence lower bound or elbow. This is the main equation. We have our inducing points. We have U, which are the latent uh, values associated with the inducing points. They follow a prior distribution. And after we see some data, we will have a posterior distribution, which a mean and covariance matrix, which are learned uh, by the model. And we use this weight matrix here to interpolate this mean and variance to other data points. At our data points, we have a F, which are the latent value, values associated with the data points. And after we integrate out this F, we arrive at Z, which is the probability of the data that was actually measured, the real data, let's say, instead of the latent values. As we need only the diagonal of the covariance matrix at the data points, we can have some computational gains here. And this integral here, the average according to the posterior distribution of F can be computed with a Gaussian quadrature, quadrature or a Monte Carlo sampling. So this uh, might look complicated, but uh, it's not that much. It's actually uh, very easy to compute. So how the VGP is trained? We have this elbow here and it's maximized with respect to the kernel parameters, if we have any, the positions of the inducing points and the variation of parameters, M and S, uh, using Adam, the same, let's say the standard uh, stochastic training algorithm. So uh, in the standard parameterization, S is a full uh, symmetric positive definite matrix. And we have a number of parameters proportional to M squared. If the inducing points coincide with the data points, we can have an optimal S, which is the, a function of the prior covariance matrix. And instead we have a, this lambda, which is a diagonal matrix. So there is a M parameters for lambda, M parameters for M, and we have it, we have two M parameters instead of M squared, which facilitates training. Something that I do is to use a whitened uh, mean for training. Uh, I found that it works really, really good. So we use a, this alpha, which is a decorrelated uh, mean. And during training, we induce the correlation back using the Cholesky decomposition of the prior covariance matrix. This is the posterior covariance matrix after we substitute uh, this new formulation here. So this uh, looks pretty much like the original GP, but instead of a single uh, noise <clears throat> uh, for a constant noise for all the, the points, we have this uh, lambda, which is actually a noise that depends, that varies for each inducing point. So this is only optimal when uh, the inducing points coincide with the data points, but uh, in the general case, it works pretty well too. I have, I have been using 
uh, and it works pretty well. So for the likelihoods, <clears throat> we can have a Gaussian likelihood, which is the, the standard uh, likelihood, which minimizes the squared error in the data. So uh, the squared error is a little, uh, usually sensitive against outliers. So we can't use it in every situation. In the mining case, uh, it's good for ion deposits and uh, it's good functions like some geophysical measurements and uh, rock types. We can use a, for example, this epsilon insensitive uh, likelihood, which was borrowed from the support vector machine. So it's a linear error instead of square error. And this uh, penalty uh, only works above a certain treasure threshold. <clears throat> So this works much better when you have a outliers and uh, non-Gaussian uh, variables. Uh, I use it a lot for ion deposits. And we can also use warping. In mining, we have many situations where the data distribution is very asymmetric uh, with long tails. And we have a constraint like the, the values can't be negative. So if you use warping, uh, we convert the data to a Gaussian distribution, do all the work, and then we convert back. And then the, the predictions will uh, respect all the constraints we include in the warping function. Hi, can I ask a we quick question? Do... Okay. Sure, can you go back to the previous slide? So I have yeah, no knowledge about um, Krieging at all. And you said that one of these is good for FE deposits and one good for AU deposits. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Okay. Uh, when you use Krieging, uh, we have a Gaussian likelihood uh, implicit. So when you talk about Krieging, we're talking about the Gaussian likelihood and squared error. So these, uh, these other likelihoods here are, uh, let's say, a feature that's specific to the VGP. Sure. Sorry. I mean, um... I mean, why is one good for one type of deposit and one, like what is the thing that's different about the deposits? Ah, okay. Uh, when we have, in iron deposits, the, the iron uh, grades are usually well behaved and they have a Gaussian marginal, the marginals and they have no outliers. In gold deposits, we usually have a lot of outliers, uh, orders of magnitude above the mean. So they okay. are very sensitive to the to a uh, Gaussian assumption. Thank you, that's really interesting. Okay. So if we have a categorical variables, we have our latent variable F. We can say if the latent variable agrees with the true label, which is E, we have a probability of one, otherwise we have zero. So to, in order to compute this, uh, average here, which involves a log. Uh, we can do this when we have zeros. So we can uh, use Jensen's inequality and uh, pull the, the log outside the, the expectation. So the, the, it becomes really simple. We have a Gaussian latent variable and the probability will be just the area below the, the Gaussian, which is above zero. So during training, the model will try to uh, move this Gaussian here to the right as most uh, as possible. I have an example here. Let's say we have uh, we are in one dimension here, and we have we assume uh, positive values for the blue class and negative values for the red class, where we have uh, blue data points. The Gaussian must be. Uh, above zero as much as possible. For the red values, the, the Gaussian must be below zero. And that's a feature that's specific uh, for uh, geology. Uh, we can easy, easily measure the actual decision boundary, which is uh, the interface between different rocks. So in these situations, uh, we want uh, the function to pass through that point uh, with high accuracy. 
and low and high confidence. So we establish a small threshold here and uh, the Gaussian must be squeezed as much as possible uh, between those limits. And that's the situation we have here. At this point, we can see the, the function moves from blue to red, but we don't have any boundary data here. So uh, it will cross zero at some point, but it will have a larger variance, uh, a lower confidence. And in this case, we want a high confidence, so a very uh, small variance. In two dimensions, we have an example here. So uh, let's say we are looking at uh, a rock wall and this rock wall uh, contains the blue and red rocks. And we can see uh, some folding. So the rocks in geological time have a plastic behavior so they can be folded and you can see some flow structures in the rock. And we have uh, some uh, black dots here for the boundaries, which we can see at the rock face. And we can also have uh, data uh, about this flow structure. And we can relate this to the gradient of the latent function and use it to constrain the model. So we can see the contour lines for the latent variable. We can convert this into probabilities for the different rocks. And if we sample the posterior GP, we can have a distribution for the possible values of this boundary between the two rocks. Uh, now for uh, scalability, you might have, have heard of the product of experts, which is used to uh, reduce the memory cost of the GP. So instead of working with the whole data, we can divide the data in parts and do a separate model for each uh, chunk of the data, let's say. And then we can combine the predictions smoothly. And uh, we can also do this for inducing points. So we have an example here. We have uh, 16 inducing points. Instead of linking every point to every other point, we divide them in, into four groups. So the, they only have correlations with points of the same color. So instead of a 256 memory cost, we only have a 64 memory cost. And this works well in practice because uh, we don't need the, this point here to have any correlation with this other point because it's uh, on the other side of the area. So we already know the correlation will be zero. Uh, this improves the scalability to some point but uh, it's still not enough for uh, the kind of problems that I have to deal with, but uh, it works. So now for the, this is the, let's say the, the main uh, contribution, which I, I hope to provide to you here. It's about uncertainty propagation. So let's say we have a pure white noise process and we take two points here, uh, x and x prime. So uh, knowing uh, f of x says uh, there's nothing about the value of f of x prime because uh, this is pure noise. So no point trying to do any predictions here. But uh, now let's assume we have uh, some uncertainty about the x and x prime. So we have a Gaussian distribution here for the possible positions of x and x prime. And now they say something about each other because uh, there is a small probability that they might actually be the same point because we don't know where the point actually is. And we can uh, compute the uh, amount of overlap between the, the, these two Gaussians here if this integral. Uh, and doing this, we, we can get the very well-known uh, squared exponential uh, kernel function. So, which gives the correlations as a fun function of distance between x and x prime. And the variance here uh, gives the, the scale, the, the amount of smoothing we are going to have with this model. So, uh, standard uh, 
you usually see an L here, so for the, the length scale. So in this interpretation, this is an actual variance for the uncertainty about the position of the, the point. Now let's say we have a variable variance. So some points might have a uh, higher uncertainty than others. Repeating the, the whole process uh, in the previous slide, considering a variable variance, we get this uh, kernel function here given by these authors. So we have uh, sigma square of x and sigma square of x prime. So there's a number of papers which try to come up with, with models for a variable variance. And usually we end up doing Monte Carlo or, or some complicated model in order to model this variable variance. But uh, here's the thing, uh, in a GP, the GP's output already has a variable uh, variance. So we can uh, use this fact to uh, build a deep GP model linking the variance of one layer uh, to the other layer using this non-stationary covariance here. For example, uh, what is usually done with the deep GPs is that we have the, the first layer here. We learn the covariance. Then we make a prediction of mean and variance. Then we must uh, take a sample of this uh, model. Then use a stationary covariance here, learn a new mean and variance, and then sample again. So each layer involves some uh, amount of sampling. If you use these non-stationary covariance, the inducing points can propagate themselves because uh, we have mean and variance here for this point and for this point. So we apply the non-stationary covariance, which takes the, the variable variance into account. And then we can analytically uh, propagate the uncertainty to the next layer. So at each layer, we can add uh, a little extra variance. So we won't have a, a point of zero, zero variance. So if we have to sample, we only sample at the last layer. So if you need to do Monte Carlo uh, to compute the elbow at the end. So we can use the, this uh, reasoning here to develop a deep VGP model I use it for spatial applications, but it could be used in principle for any kind of application. So we have a GP node, which propagates this uh, uncertainty. Uh, it uses the, the non-stationary kernel function. And each GP has a uh, callback live uh, divergence, which we add to the elbow at the end. It can have a linear node if you want uh, variables to be correlated. So I use a orthonormal weight matrix in order to preserve the total variance of the, the variables. We can concatenate because in spatial applications, you don't want the, the output space to collapse. So uh, we don't want to, two points to be mapped to the same point in the next layer. This is usually the case in for, for general uh, deep learning applications, but uh, in spatial applications, this is actually uh, undesirable. We can have the product of experts and we can have some nonlinear nodes like uh, multiplication and exponentiation. I don't use this uh, a lot because uh, it makes the output non-Gaussian and then we have no choice but to sample. So let me give you an example here. Uh, this is a gold deposit. We have some 48,000 uh, variables, I asked 48,000 data points. It's a single output variable, which is the, the gold content for the samples. And I have divided the, the data into three parts and we have three GPs. Each GP has its own set of inducing points, 2,000 per expert. 
they are a function of x, y, and z in the three dimensions. And then we combine them using a product of experts. And then at the output, we have a epsilon insensitive uh, likelihood with warping. So this is the result. In blue, we have uh, data points with low uh, gold content. The red uh, dots have the largest gold content. And this is a gray shell. So what this means is that uh, inside the solid here, all points have at least 50% chance of being a heavy higher gold content than 0.5 parts per million or uh, grams per ton of gold. You can see some extreme uh, data points are filtered out. So single outlier in the middle of uh, low gold content. We can see here the warping function. So this is the value that's interpolated in the GP, which is, has uh, been normalized to a Gaussian distribution. And then when we convert back, we can see a, an increasing slope, which indicates a, a high positive asymmetry in the data distribution. And these are the logs, the log of the gold content. So the original gold content has even higher uh, asymmetry than this. A quick Another question, example. Maybe. Oh, sure. Uh, how do you compute the, um, the 3D shape on this graph? Ah, the, the, the solid here? Yeah. It's, uh, we interpolate in a regular grid and then we use a uh, 3D contouring. Okay, it's the marching cubes. Mm. It's the marching cubes algorithm. If you have a variable in a regular grid, it can uh, compute this 3D contour here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in this example, we have uh, two variables, X and Y, and we have uh, some metal contamination in the land. There are seven metals. So I use seven independent uh, GPs. And then we pass them through a linear node in order to induce correlations between them. And then we have a different output for each metal concentration. Uh, again, I use the epsilon insensitive likelihood. And in this case, we have a only 259 data points, but seven output variables. So this is the result. As the, the metal concentrations themselves are not uh, Gaussian distributed, instead of being invariance, we have a median and a confidence interval. This scatter plot here shows the training error. So, there's a, there's a good agreement between the, the model and, and the actual data. And this is the interesting part. We can see here uh, the individual histograms for each uh, method. So uh, some are very uh, asymmetric, others are more symmetric. And uh, as we use warping, we can learn uh, nonlinear correlations. So you can see as the, the correlation between them uh, follows a curve. And these values here are the correlation in the warped space in which they are linear. So some have a very, very pretty high correlation. Let me see another one here. This one is almost linear. This one is interesting. So 0.56 correlation. And they follow this curve here. And we can see that the outliers uh, don't influence the, the result. So the, the line stays close to the bulk of the data in this case here. Another case, uh, this is just a, a, a control example. If you have a heterocidastic output, so instead of a heterocidastic noise, which you, you can see in some published papers, in this case, it's not the noise that's variable, but the amplitude of the, the phenomenon. 
at this variable. You can see here there's a uh, tenfold uh, increase in amplitude here at the center. So we can do this small network here. We have one GP for the base phenomenon, which is a uh, sinusoid fun function. And another GP, which we exponentiate to give the amplitude. So uh, it will necessarily be larger than zero. And then you multiply the two together and we have the final result here. Another example uh, of a non-stationary uh, case. So instead of a change in amplitude, we have a change in frequency, an abrupt change in frequency here. So we have X, we learn a GP and concatenate the result back to X. So the, we can see the, uh, the, the larger space here with X and the intermediate GP. And the intermediate GP has a variable variance, which when you uh, use it uh, as input to the, to the second GP, it becomes capable of modeling this case here, this has a uh, smaller variance in the y direction than in this part here. So this is the covariance matrix for the intermediate GP. And this is the final covariance matrix for the, the second GP. We have been able to uh, learn this pattern here, all analytically propagating the, the uncertainty through the layers. This is another example, uh, which is a gold deposit. But in this case, we have some auxiliary uh, geolo geological variables. So we have some geological terminology here as the, the size of grains and things like that. We have two continuous uh, auxiliary variables and also some uh, categorical variables. And we can do a simple model like this. This is what is usually done in uh, mining engineering. We have X, Y and the, the end variable here, but we can also use all this extra information and make a more, uh, let's say a more rich model. So we, uh, I have modeled the, the four categorical variables here in separate the two continuous variables here in separate. So we have the first GP, we concatenate, always concatenate back with the original variables. So this is a deep learning model. We have a second GP here. We use these variables to model the, uh, this data, but we can uh, also use the latent variables which were learned and combine them with the corresponding uh, variables for the continuous output variables, always linking back to the original coordinates. Then we have eight variables here. We learn another GP, which condenses all this information, link back to the coordinates again, and then we'll, we learn uh, the gold map. So here's the result. Uh, here at the top for the stationary model, we have the, the median, and let's say a lower and upper bound for the, the possible values uh, of the, the gold <clears throat> in each point. And this is the deep learning version. You can see it's a richer model. I can't guarantee for you that it's realistic, but uh, it's richer at least. The most uh, features that most call our attention here is the possibility to make curves, which is not possible for with the stationary model. And uh, looking at the models for the intermediate variables, we can see that these flow patterns here are respected by the final model. So there is uh, some relationships between the variables that uh, the model was able to learn. And then we have the, the differential GP. So we have this work here. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, the authors use a latent vector field 
to move the, the input data in space. So the, the data is more, let's say, uh, more aligned and easier to learn in the later uh, layer in the model. So we have this differential equation. So we have x of time t at time t plus one. We use the mean of the vector field, which is a GP, multiply uh, by the, the time that path that has path. And we have the, the covariance multiplied by this W, which is a random noise with variance proportional to the time that passes. This is a stochastic differential equation. So you can see that the points uh, are spread around space and they move and they uh, are spread as time passes. If you use the non-stationary covariance that I showed you, we can do something similar, but propagating this uncertainty analytically as time passes. So this is in, in practice, this is in a continuous time, it's actually a number of time increments. So we have X, we have the GP, which, which gives the, the vector field. And then we use the, the field to move the original points. They have a new position, new variance. So they move them again uh, for a certain, certain number of steps. And then uh, in this case here, the model can learn uh, the, the size of the step, which is uh, very interesting. So we have a, another X prime here, which has been moved from the original position. So uh, let me show you an example here. This is the original work. They have this non-stationary uh, data here. We can see how the points and B are being moved. So we have the sum amount of noise because uh, of the, the data is sampled at each time step. So we can see this part of the space here is compressed. And here where we have an, an abrupt change, the space is expanded. So after we move the, the points, it's easier to fit the stationary GP uh, to model the, the data better. And this is the, the equivalent solution when using the, the no stationary covariance. So it is the same case. We have a compression here at the constant part, an expansion where we have the abrupt changes, but uh, we can see that the, this is the, let's say the standard deviation for each data point. We can see how the, the, we have this cone here as the variance increases, but uh, the end result is pretty much the same. And we have been able to do this analytically. So we have this table from the original work and this result is uh, competitive with the, the original work. It isn't better every time for some reason for the, the Boston data set is much worse, but for the, the other cases here, uh, it's pretty competitive. So we can do more or less the same thing, but without having to sample the model at each time step. And this is very interesting for geological modeling. So we have drill holes here. We have to, to drill the, the rock mass in order to figure out which rocks we have underground. So we have a yellow and a purple rock. This is the stationary model. We can see the boundary, the 50% probability is supposed to be the boundary between the, the two kinds of rocks. So we can see the stationary GP gives a very diffuse boundary. When you use this differential GP, uh, it learns this vector field that moves the, the, the original points. And so it learns a much better rock model than the stationary GP, which a much sharper transition, which is a 
what we want in the, in the first place. We have an example for time series modeling. This is the data of the solar cycle. So we count the number of uh, spots in the sun with the passage of time. For this case, we do a little feature engineering. We take the, the time I here, compute a few uh, sines and cosines, and use the sines and cosines as input to the GP. So here we have the stationary GP. It uh, doesn't learn the, the periodic pattern very well. It doesn't extrapolate uh, very far from the data. And this is the non-stationary model with the differential GP. So we can see it propagates the, this pattern better. So you have a rise and uh, it falls down slowly. Uh, steep rise and falls down slowly. So we can see this pattern is propagated for a longer period of time. So to conclude, uh, specifically for spatial applications, uh, VGP works uh, faster because uh, the machine is learning uh, everything by itself. We don't have to do a lot of manual work, which is usually done uh, for uh, problems like this. It can be more flexible because you can use different variables. But the, the, the thorn in my uh, foot here is still scalability because we usually need a, a lot of inducing points. So uh, let's say uh, in the first gold example, we uh, have to use uh, 6,000 inducing points. And uh, I could have used more if I had more memory. And for general applications, uh, I imagine this might be uh, make it easier to train GPGPs because you don't have to sample at each layer. The differential node is monotonic. So we, uh, you might desire a monotonic model in certain situations. In the spatial uh, application, certainly we need this. It can't have uh, the, the points crossing each other uh, as we learn the model. And we can use the product of experts uh, not only for data points in the standard GP, but, but also for the inducing points. So if you have a lot of data, you can make things easier. These are the references that I mentioned along the presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, I haven't uh, spoken too fast. And I have here a little example of the, the training process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Italo. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from the audience? I, I have one possibly naive question. So is it, am I understanding it correctly that essentially you're implicitly assuming that you have a white noise kernel on every layer of your DGP and the non-stationary kernel comes as a result of you propagating the Gaussian uncertainty at each step through. So you don't, you, it's not like you're using a squared exponential kernel within your each layer of your deep GP. You're just using a white noise kernel at every layer. Is that, is that okay. right? Am I misunderstanding? Uh, let me get back there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here. Yeah. Actually, the, the white noise. Uh, it's the, the start of the derivation of the, the whole thing. So we start okay. with white noise. Yeah. But after, uh, let's say you pass a Gaussian filter through this data here. Then the result is that uh, is the square exponential kernel. So this is yeah. the, the actual kernel that is used after we do this integral here. Yeah, so, so that's that's if you had if you had Gaussian yeah. uncertainty around each input location, yes, yes. then the result is a squared exponential. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the the goal of this slide is to arrive at the square the squared exponential kernel yeah. as a result of assuming uncertainty 
in your input. Yeah. And that, so, uh, I guess it, so can you explain again where the non-stationary, the, so the next slide, I think it is. the Yes. So oh. uh, in this case, we have a variable uh, variance for this Gaussian here. So you do the same process, the same integral, yeah. but now the, the variance is different in X and X prime. But are you still not assuming the same, the same white noise kernel with, now you have different uncertainty, no, no. you have different variance of each uncertainty of each input location, but are you not implicitly still assuming white noise kernel? Well, uh, after we assume the uncertainty, uh, I didn't do the, the I figure about this, but uh, the process is not white noise anymore. Because when you assume uncertainty, you, you smooth it out, you know. So you have a, uh, after we, you do this integral here, you have something more like this, which is uh, what we are used to. Yeah. So the, the white noise is just the start of the derivation of this covariance here. And going back here, if you happen to have uh, the same variance for X and X prime, you recover the, the squared exponential kernel. So this is a, can be seen as a generalization of the, the squared exponential kernel. Yeah. This is the, the covariance that's actually uh, computed in the examples. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand that. I'm just, the, typically when you're do, doing a deep Gaussian process, you might, you have a different kernel on each layer, right? So your, your, your prediction from one layer, you're propagating the uncertainty from that prediction, but the next layer is again, a might be a squared exponential and you're propagating all of the uncertainty. And then as a result, the output is non-Gaussian, right? Mm. Okay. Well, I, I, if you look at the, the first and the, the, uh, at the uh, last layer and the first layer, uh -huh. the result from the, from the beginning to the, to the end of the, the network is not yeah. going to be Gaussian, but, uh, but, uh, from, from one layer to the next, you have this uh, Gaussian output, in this case, at least. When you use this kernel, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I had one question regarding, is the problem where you look for the gold deposit, but you have a set of other variables alongside it? Okay. Um, I was wondering how do you train how do you train this model? Because there's some kind of here, some kind of hierarchy. So do you train some models first, then feed back to your deep GP model? Yeah, on this slide. Yes, uh, every everything is trained together. So we have a likelihood for each uh, categorical variable, uh, continuous likelihood for these variables here, and a likelihood for the gold. So you add everything together at the elbow. Let me go back to the main formula here. Here. So this is the case for one variable. If you have many variables, you can add the, the likelihood uh, part for each variable and each GP in the network will have a Kobeck library divergence that, that you add to the elbow too. So the, all the variables are actually uh, trained together. Okay, so you, you train them all at once and not in sequence then? No, no, all at once. Okay. You can do batches of data points if you have to, but uh, the variables are trained together. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, and uh, out of curiosity, so what are you using in terms of software for, for all those models? What framework are you using? I am using a TensorFlow. So let me 
go back here. I have this repository here. I called it a GeoML, so Geo Machine Learning. So I am actually developing this uh, based on TensorFlow. Okay. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not professional code. I, I'm not a software engineer, but uh, well, I had to do it because uh, I couldn't find something like this anywhere else. Have you pushed, have you pushed, have you pushed any higher than three input dimensions? Uh, excuse me. Have you tried? Um, you shared an example with three three dimensional space. I'm just curious if you've tried. Pushing to higher dimensions. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't have an example here, though. The only example I, I have is for these data points here, these uh, data sets. Oh, yeah, cool. So this one has eight variables. These are the, the UCI uh, data sets. Yeah, yeah, nice. Eight variables, uh, four variables. In principle, it should work. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Not from the room, I don't think. Anyone on, online? Okay. looks like we're done then. Uh, thanks a lot for the great presentation. It was very nice. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.